Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Revenue Revolutionaries. I'm your host, Dave Duke. This week, I'm super excited to welcome Ed Powers to the show. Ed is very well known in customer success circles, and he spends a lot of time thinking about the, the neuroscience and the psychology of managing customer relationships. This week, we spend time talking about expectation setting and the role that that plays in successful success planning. Um, just a ton of wisdom here, a ton of uh, experience uh, coming coming to life through through this discussion with Ed. I'm so excited to welcome Ed Powers to this episode of Revenue Revolutionaries. Let's go. Hey Ed, welcome to the podcast. It's great to be with you. Hey, thanks for the for the opportunity. I always love, love talking to you, Dave. I'm excited to sit down today and talk about this idea of of expectations, um, but then in relationship to to success planning, which is near and dear to our hearts. Uh, really excited to talk to you because I know you you spend a lot of time thinking about the the science and the psychology between. Um, all of the concepts that we talk about within customer management and, and, and kind of relationship management. So before we get into it, tell us a little bit about your, your background and, and uh, what you're up to these days. Sure. Well, I've uh, been in business a long time. Um, and about the last eight years or so, I've been working in customer success, both as a, an executive as well as a consultant. Um, so I've been working with a lot of different companies and um, as you say, I have a, a real deep interest in how the brain works, because I think at the end of the day, it's all about people. And the more we understand about how uh, our customers think about things and how they decide what they decide, um, then we can do a better job for them. Absolutely. And I, I think it kind of goes without saying, but it needs to be said, uh, you know, when you're in sales, you're in managing customers, or you're just kind of working through the day to day of, of, of business, we're all psychologists in some way or another. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense to really start to break that down. So, so let's do that. And, you know, within the business, uh, relationship, uh, what, whatever angle you're, you're talking about internal, external, there's this, this need to set expectations. So let's talk about expectations. Uh, first off, um, how do you think about expectations? W what are they? Well, I think you would agree and probably your listeners agree as well, Dave, is that um, you know managing customer expectations is really important. You know, no one would disagree with that, right? right. Uh, but as you say, what does that mean? And wh what does it mean to manage expectations and what are they even to begin with? And uh, expectations are really just beliefs about what's going to happen in the future. That's mm -hmm. that's really how it's defined. Excellent. And then, yeah, I know you think a little bit, a, a lot, a lot about um, how the brain uses them. So, yeah. what what does that look like? Well, you know, it, it's funny because it's all about storage. Okay. You know, we think that uh, our our perception of our own brain is that we have limitless storage capability, right? Because we we remember so many things, we recall things from our childhood or facts or figures, things like that. So we we believe that our brain is is limitless in what it can store and what it can remember. And in fact, um, neuroscientists look at that and they say, yeah, that's not actually the case. Mm. And the estimates are that the brain can only store about a gig. Believe it okay. or not on the order of about a gig. So my phone here is 64 times that, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. It, it comes as, as a surprise because when you think about our five senses, right, we're constantly getting data thrown at us throughout the course of the day, visual information and sound information and touch everything else. Uh, they estimate we get about 80 gigs mm. of data being thrown at us every day. So the question is how on earth does the brain deal with that, right? You get 80 times more information in a day than you get for your whole lifetime, right? Yeah. So what the brain uses are expectations. And it's really clever how the brain is architected uh, to do exactly that, the neural architecture in the brain. What the, what the brain does is it takes all this data coming at it every day mm -hmm. and it compares it with its expectations. Okay. And if the expectations are pretty much in line with what it's getting, it just throws the data out. 
And the only time it really cares about that data is if it if it deviates from what it expects. Mm. And then it kind of sets it aside. And it, it may, if there's a lot of that data, it may go back and adjust its expectations. So mm. it's a masterful thing. It, and, the, and neuroscientists have found that this is in all parts of the brain. It's not just a sensory system, but it's actually how we understand everything. It's about how we understand relationships okay. and science and business and politics and everything else, right? So everything is based upon beliefs and expectations. Fascinating. So what's the relationship between expectations and behaviors? Well, it, because it, it's uh, everything that we do is perceived through our, our beliefs and our expectations, it alters how we perceive everything. And it's, it's interesting because we all perceive our beliefs and expectations are all slightly different from each other. So uh, what that means is how you perceive reality is a little bit different than how I perceive reality, right? Right, right. So, and for example, and there's some uh, famous experiments on this. If I were to hand you two glasses of wine. And I said, Dave, you know, this one glass comes from, from a $50 bottle of wine. And this other glass comes from a $5 bottle, bottle of wine. And then I asked you to rate which one you think tastes better. Which one do you think you would, you would rate high? You're going to gravitate towards the expensive. The more expensive one. Bottle. And they've proven that. And even when the wine in the glass is exactly the same wine from exactly the same bottle, right? So just by setting an expectation about what you're getting or altering your expectations, that alters how you perceive something. So not only is it true on how we perceive things, but it's how we learn. In fact, the brain has to have an expectation before it can learn anything mm. because it has to compare it to something, right? Yeah. And, uh, and the same thing when it comes to value, right? Meta CX is all about value and how we perceive and what we decide uh, is based upon value. And how do we perceive that? Well, that's based upon our beliefs about that value. Yeah, yeah. I, I like where this is going. Um, so before we get into to that relationship between expectations and, and success planning and, and managing the customer relationship directly, um, I know you think about also the risks of letting uh, the other side kind of set their own expectations. Uh, so talk a little bit about that if you could. Yeah, uh, expectations are really interesting, especially in novel situations. So let me talk about that. Okay. When, when you're dealing with something that's brand new and let me uh, use an example from pre-COVID days. Okay. So let's say that you are at a theme park and you love to ride roller coasters. And if, you know, uh, one of the big draws of a theme park is a new ride. Mm -hmm. right? they, they bring mm -hmm. out a new roller coaster. So they'll advertise that and people will show up to try out the new ride. So um, while you're there, I mean, you, you, the, you, what your brain does, this is a new experience for you. The first thing your brain does is it is going to recall something that's similar, right? Mm -hmm. You've been on a roller coaster before you kind of know what to expect. Right. But as you're sitting there in line, right, you're, you're sitting there in line and you're waiting along with everybody else you're watching what's going on. You're hearing people scream on the ride as it goes overhead, or maybe if it's a water ride, you may look at people coming off the ride. Are they completely soaked or are they just a little bit wet? You know, yeah, things like yeah. that. So you're gathering all this information. You may be talking to people or listening as they're coming off the ride. You know, all these, these people coming off the ride, what are they saying? Are they saying that was cool or, oh, I can't believe that or whatever. So yeah. you're, you're gathering all that data. You may be talking to people in line who have been on the ride before. You may go to your phone and look mm -hmm. it up and what are the reviews saying? So we are compelled to try to set expectations before we learn anything, right? Mm -hmm. And we do mm -hmm. this subconsciously, automatically. What we do is we, we first start with what we know we think that's similar, but our confidence is usually not very high in, in what that is. Mm -hmm. And so we try to supplement that with other data. So we, we all go through this process. Now, that's what happens in a novel situation. After you have that experience, it's kind of like concrete. You know, right, if, if, right. You, if you go to a, a, a job site, they pour concrete into molds, right? And over time, right. it dries and it, it firms up and, you know, you got what you got. Yeah, <laughs> After yeah. that's, that when, it, when they it. take the mold away, that's what, that is your shape. And that's exactly how these expectations work is that over time, they really, really firm up, right? So what mm -hmm. this means is you have this window of opportunity 
at the very beginning where you can shape what that is, mm. because we all go through this natural process of trying to gather that information. So where does that happen? Well, that happens in the sales process, right? As they're right. looking at you, they're looking at, at competitors, they're, they're listening to experts, they're looking at reviews. So all of this is shaping their expectations about what they think they're going to get. So um, all of this is, is critically important and you don't want to leave this to chance, right? Right. Right. Because what happens is after those those beliefs and expectations firm up, then you get another behavior, which is called confirmation bias. Mm. And that means that, you know, you're much more inclined to uh, pay attention to information that supports your beliefs and not listen to information that that can, you know, contradicts with what your beliefs are. Right. So you right. tend to filter that out. But once you make up your mind, it's really hard to change your mind. Right, so you right. have this this window of opportunity to really get this thing right. And, you know, I sold for a number of years in a former yeah. life. And uh, every once in a while, I would have a customer that would say, you know, I, I really hate this product that I bought from you. And I say, well, why? What, mm. what, what don't you like about it? Well, I mm. thought it would do X. And I was like, well, where on earth did you get that idea? <laughs> this has nothing to do with this product. I never said that. I, you know, it's not in any of our materials. It's not any of the documentation. Where did that come from? Uh -huh. So what the worst thing in the world is, is really leaving that to chance. There's another interesting um, behavior that we all have. We're all natural optimists. Humans are, are optimistic. Mm -hmm. And uh, what that leads to is, is a bias called planning fallacy, okay. which is why... Um, you know, those weekend projects, you think they'll take an hour and they wind up taking three. Yeah. And it's I've, because I know of, a little something about that. Something about that. Maybe <laughs> from this last weekend. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, you know, you always have those multiple trips to the hardware store and it's not quite right. And, you know, they're, your whole Saturday's gone. And, and it's, it's because of this optimism bias. We look at somebody and say, well, how hard can this be? Of course, this is going to be easy. So we tend to dramatically underestimate the time, the cost, and the effort it is to get whatever value we're trying to get, right? So that, yeah. that is a common thing as well. So that's why you don't want to leave this to chance is that you want to really help them uh, to, uh, you know, to set that, to really set those beliefs early before they solidify. And then it alters everything they do and think and ultimately decide when it comes to renewals. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's keep building on that. And it's, it's, it's really the great segue into, you know, what this, this, expectation role plays in in managing customers uh and I, I vividly remember the first time we met we sat down for for lunch and we were talking about why it's so important to explain how this relationship is going to work and, and just to your points it is it really early setting the tone for uh for for the entire relationship quite frankly and and, and so talk a little bit more about uh, why, maybe just expand on what you're just saying, why it's so important to explain how we're going to work together with, with a new customer. Yeah. And this goes to success planning. And I, you know, this is, uh, something that you do not want to leave to chance that it should be something that is repeatable and systematic because the downside is so is so awful, right? <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, you can, you can deliver your product or service amazingly well, but if it doesn't comport with their expectations, then it doesn't matter, right? It's it's what they think and what they expect and what they believe compared to what they get is what mm -hmm. makes up their mind about this, right? So, yeah. so we, we tend to focus on the delivery aspect and not on how do we shape that belief? How do we shape that expectation? And to do it very um, systematically and repeatably is, is so critically important. So part of success planning is really... Um, is to have this conversation and it's not a presentation, right? I mean, hmm. I, I do a lot of work, uh, consulting work with, with companies and they, they say, well, give me a template, you know, get, how do I present this? This is not a presentation, right? That's so what, what this is, is a conversation. And mm -hmm. you say to that person, and you, and you do this in the sales cycle when you're close to the end of the, the deal, right? You're at yeah. the, the deals on the five yard line. You don't do it way up front, but when you're getting close and what you do is you say, have you thought about what success looks like, mm -hmm. right? And how do you measure that? And, and that forces people to think about their beliefs and their expectations, right? Mm -hmm. It's just to talk about what, how do you think, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to make a decision. This is a subscription-based offering. You're going to make that decision. What are you going to make that decision on? Yeah. And have them unpack that. Well, I, you know, I hadn't thought about that, or I did think about that, or we're looking for explicitly this. 
And that's a great time to start shaping those beliefs and expectations and to suggest how to measure that, right? In a way yeah. that maybe benefits you or maybe you've seen work with other customers and customers are interested in that. They'll say, uh, well, tell me more about that. Well, you know, customers that we work with just like you mm -hmm. tend to do it this way. Here's how they measure that, right? Yeah, yeah. So to put, so put something out there and to suggest that because they're formulating those beliefs and expectations, right? That's still very fluid. Then it's a question of, well, what can we expect if we measure, for example, productivity, we can say to, to a customer, you know what, it sounds like productivity is really important to you. Our customers believe that as well. Here's how we measure that. And you know mm. what, on average, our customers see about a 17% improvement in productivity, right? On average, yeah. we have some, here's the distribution. We have some that get none, zero yeah. improvement. We have some that get 34%, twice that, right? Well, that causes them to think, well, huh, did I think it was 17%? You know, maybe I thought it was 50%. So right away, I'm starting to yeah. anchor on something that is real, that is meaningful, right? Yeah. And, and it raises the question, well, why do some people get more than others, right? Yeah, yeah. that's where I was about to go next. So by, by you know, laying it out like that, you're saying there, there really is a spectrum here. Mm -hmm. And we want to, we want to get to this kind of best case scenario. Uh, but that's going to require us to do certain things. So is, is that where you're going with it? You start to then have this opportunity within that conversation to explain how we're going to, to get to that best case scenario within the relationship because it takes two to, to tango. Exactly. And, and as you know, I mean, you're in the technology business is that technology is only one piece of this, right? right I mean, there's a right. lot of other things. When as soon as you introduce a new technology, you've just changed the process and you have a people factor, right? So you've yeah, got a lot yeah. of things. It's not just this one thing that solves everything. It's a combination of things that do, right? Yeah. So what we're talking about are key success factors. What does it take? What does it really take to get these results? What is it that we're going to do? And what is it that you have to do, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So now, for example, change management, right? When you have a disruptive technology, people have to change what they're doing to something that's new, right? And we all push back on that. We all push back on, on, on um, having to change our day-to-day -day behaviors. And we mm -hmm. have these habits and, you know, mm -hmm. I got enough to do. I don't know. I don't have time to learn this new <laughs> thing. And I've got deadlines and I got COVID. I got all this other stuff. Right, right. Yeah. So now you're forcing me to do something I don't want to do. I'm going to push back, right? So that's a completely natural human reaction, but that has a huge impact on whether or not someone adopts the technology, right? Totally. So you need to manage that change. So one of the things that you would talk to this executive about is, look, this is completely natural, normal. Everybody responds this way. We need to work together on managing that change. Here's what I need you to do. Here's what we'll do. Here's what you need to do. And if you do those yeah. things, we're going to get those better outcomes. And yeah. we can demonstrate that when customers like you do these things, they get better results. Can I count on you to do that? Right. Yeah. This is that window of opportunity where you've done a couple of things. You've anchored them on reality. You've told them what they need to do and you've gotten their commitment to do it, right. right? This is all prior to the close. When they walk away from that, there's like, holy cow, this isn't, I'm not just talking to a salesperson who's trying to sell me something, make their commission. These people really care about me. They really care about this outcome. They really want this to work. Yeah. I feel really strongly about them. This is the right choice, right? So that helps to, to get that deal close and it sets you up for success after the fact. Right, right. It, it, yeah, exa that's exactly what I was thinking about is it just helps in so many ways. It helps us get the deal done because yeah. we're being very kind of candid and transparent, mm -hmm. but also uh, we're thinking about their best interests, which we, I think we all can appreciate goes a long way. Uh, but then we always talk about, you know, good fit customers or bad fit customers. And there's a window of opportunity there to really examine that as well because if the customer or the the prospect at that stage is not showing positive signs that they are fully committed to this exercise then we can we can kind of raise raise a hand which i know is complicated in, in getting a close one business but um, i think we're we're all starting to fully appreciate the importance of of getting it right very early because of those those consequences downstream of, of not doing that uh so it's um so it, it's great in many, many ways. So where, where do companies struggle here? Is it um, 
just not being comfortable with that conversation? Is it not knowing how to, to navigate that? What, what do you see uh, and what have you seen over the years? Well, I think it's it's a lack of understanding about how important it is to begin mm-hmm. with. So you know, part of this, this conversation, hopefully raise some awareness on it. Yeah. The second is that if, if we understand the mechanics of it and the window of opportunity that we have, and we capitalize on that, that's going to help us, right? Yeah. But people don't necessarily, you know, think about that. They, they think about, well, managing expectations, of course, that's important, but they don't think, well, how do I do that? And why is right. that important? So I think part of this is just getting the awareness and the, the desire to want to change something. Then it's, how do we do that mechanically? How do mm. we wrap that in? Because salespeople, to your point, they don't want to uh, that's going to be reality. If the if the customer believes something, great. You know, if they think this is the greatest thing on earth, right? But you know that part of it is to have salespeople that understand it's not about whatever I say to get the deal done because I'm going to have to renew this customer, and it's in my best interest to make sure we have the right customers and they are happy because they're going to buy more and they're going to tell their friends about this, right? Exactly. So yeah. let's let's do that. Let's not just make this this day this sale and make my quota this month. Let's think longer term. And their leadership and the business needs to revolve around that. Is that, you know, do we really are we thinking short term or long term here? Because if we're yeah. in the SaaS business, we got to think long term. If we if we don't think long term, we're going to be underwater. These customers are going to turn out, right? So yeah. So it is that that orientation of this is a long term thing. We are we are committed to each other. Right? Yeah, and and to that point, it really speaks to uh, that that internal alignment. You know, making sure that you know sales, CS, services, we're on the same page relative to the approach because mm-hmm. it's in everybody's best interest. If we're mm-hmm. truly going to be customer centric, we need to uh, embrace. Uh, kind of tactics like this within within the sales process because um to the points we it's uh, you may it's the only way that we we create a healthy customer base exactly very good um yeah. i know you also think about the role of, of sponsors yeah. and i'd love for you to expand on that as well so what's the role of sponsor sponsorship here in, in success planning yeah, and you know it's funny because I we emailed over the weekend I read I read a phenomenal book about this that really got me thinking about sponsors and their role and that, you know, in B2B, you know, different from consumers, consumers, individuals can make decisions in Mm -hmm. business. It's almost always a group of people, you know, that participate in making a decision. I've heard some numbers like on average seven or eight people are involved. So uh, the sponsors are really important because they have, they are the people that uh, other people look to and trust and they're in positions of authority and they have profound influence around the beliefs that other people adopt. That's this book I was telling you about over the weekend, yeah. where you know these, these scientists looked at, the, the name of the book is The Misinformation Age, How False Beliefs Spread. Mm. And uh, these are scientists that wrote the book and they do modeling, you know, mathematical modeling of these behaviors and how people interact with each other using agent-based modeling. And then they, they can see these behaviors on a large scale. So it explains, you know, our politics, how people get in two different camps and we have all this polarity and all these other kinds of things happening, but also how beliefs form and become mm. shared by a group of people, right? So. Okay a new scientific uh, fact comes out and how does the scientific community react to that and how do they adopt to that and how do they push? So all of these dynamics they've kind of modeled out and Mm. what they come back to is back to beliefs and setting expectations in novel environments. Where where does the brain go? Well, what do people in authority say? That's Mm -hmm. that's a very important data point. What are people around me saying? Right. Part of the point of this book is when you're in your echo chamber, that tends to reinforce things. Sure. These are people like you. So you tend to adopt the beliefs and you conform to what the group is, is doing mm-hmm. and your own confidence in your own beliefs, which is that confirmation bias. So all three of those things play together. So when you're dealing with prior to the sale, the decision makers, mm-hmm. these people have profound impact and influence on what the group believes about you, what the group, mm-hmm. what are their beliefs and expectations form, how do they form is very much determined by those key influencers in the decision. So those are the right people. Mm -hmm. And what's so cool about what you guys are doing in MetaCX is that 
you're facilitating this. You're, you are creating these beliefs and behaviors with data, right? right. right. <laughs> with right. evidence, yeah. which anchors them on what is appropriate and what is expected and helps them be successful. And you're proving it in their own numbers, right? It's not right. about, I'm not going to BS you on this. These are your figures. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Do you not trust your own numbers. These are your own numbers. Right. So because you are having these conversations and forcing them to make the implicit explicit and to really think about this and to get really good, solid expectations. And then after you go through onboarding, you prove it to them in their own numbers, those same influential people, you have just solidified that whole belief. These people really know what they're talking about. They delivered the value they promised they did. They, right. they would. We trust them. Why would we go anywhere else, right? That is an extremely powerful because now you've shaped the beliefs of a lot of people at that company. Right? Yeah, it's yeah. it's so cool what you guys are doing. Oh, thank you, thank you. And it, I I think it's it's just, but to me it starts to be just foundational um, to to business and this this idea of customer success that we we've been talking about for. Uh, I argue since, since the beginning of business, because it's always been about, you know, delivering value to the customer. Uh, But we know things break down all the time. So why not just stay focused on, on the task at hand and work in the, in the right context Um, and technology can help us do that in new ways, which is exciting to do. Uh, But to your point also, it's, um, you know, often an exercise of just kind of wrangling every, every, <laughs> every stakeholder and the information, the, the, the progress, if you will, and then uh, the, the data where there really is the, the, the story. So we just need to think about ways to, to help organizations and, and those that are managing relationships uh, manage that more effectively, especially when we kind of throw everything else that we do at them. So it's, it's complicated, but um, we, to, to all of our, our points throughout this discussion, we have to just come back to um, how we how we manage it day to day and then how we um, we set ourselves up for success over the long term. Mm-hmm. Um, any final points on on just this this role of expectations and success planning? Well, just to reinforce, you know, uh, underscore reinforce highlight just you know, if we only focus on the delivery, if we only focus on the product and executing good onboarding or implementation or whatever, that's only half the story, you know, Mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, everything is compared to our beliefs and expectations. And we have that just critical moment in that relationship, uh, that time when that when that concrete is in liquid stage yeah, <laughs> before yeah. it firms up. Love that and analogy. if we can put those, those in our brain and say, well, how do we do that? How do we capitalize that? And how do we do that repeatedly and effectively and systematically? If we can just do that one piece, man, we just make our lives so much better downstream and, and the lives of our customers. So I think yeah. it's, it, 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 let's just not lose sight of that. I think people just don't really understand just how important this is. Fantastic. Well, it really is just about creating shared success. I mean, we talk a lot about that on this podcast, uh, but we often need to break it down to to the to the fundamentals. And I, I, I really appreciate appreciate you Ed uh, helping us do that today with this this really important topic. So, thank you very much for for hanging out with me today, joining the, this episode of of the podcast. Uh, I think we should pick it up at some time in the future. I know you have so, so many. Um, different perspectives and experiences to, to share with our audience. So thank you for, for the time today. My pleasure, Dave. I always enjoy talking to you. An amazing conversation with Ed. I knew it was going to be valuable uh, because of, of you know, the way that he thinks about customer management. I, I love this idea of just quite literally explaining how this relationship is going to work through a conversation, not relaying on a, a presentation, just a few slides, it is having a candid and transparent conversation with a late stage prospect about how we're going to uh, manage this relationship, uh, but what it's going to take from both sides, you know, from a, from a kind of strategic standpoint, but then at a tactical level, uh, we're going to need some things for you from you to make this a, a success over the long term, um, because that's what we're thinking about. Uh, as we we step into this new partnership, you know, sometimes I think that's going to present some difficult conversations. Um, but uh, at the end, I think it 
uh, articulates that you have the best interest of the, the new customer at heart. And that goes a, a long, long way as, as Ed spoke to. So a big thank you to Ed Powers for joining me for this episode of Revenue Revolutionaries. Thank you too, as always, really appreciate you hanging out with me. This has been a MetaCX production.